How is it going everybody? Dr. Coin back at it again and welcome to the Coin Cave. In today's episode, we're going to be having a guest joining us and this kid is a bit of a maverick when it comes to Canadian coins. I'd say he is a bit of a prodigy and he is what I would consider an expert when it comes to grading and identifying proofs and specimens and errors and stuff like that. I've been uh, having an online correspondence with him for a long time and he was nice enough to actually um, agree to a collaboration so I'm very excited to be able to bring him on the show and he brought some of his pieces so some of the stuff in his collection is just absolutely mind-blowing when I say mind-blowing I mean some of this stuff is like once in a lifetime you will see so the fact that I actually get to hold some of it I was shaking when I was looking at some of these things so make sure to stay tuned to the end of the interview when we go through one by one of some of the pieces that he brought and showed me because man my mind was just blown and these things are absolutely incredible some of the most beautiful historic pristine Canadian coins you could ever imagine in history but this kid like I said is a maverick so knowledgeable his wealth of knowledge is incredible so if you guys would like to learn I really think you should all pay attention if I seem very quiet it's just because I was blown away and so impressed at uh, how much this guy knows but before I can get into this interview I would really appreciate if y'all would hit that thumbs up and subscribe for more coin collecting videos just like this and then what do you say I introduce you to my friend Burlington Bullion or Coal. So welcome, Cole, right? Yeah, Cole. Cole. All right, also known as Burlington Bullion Burlington on Bullion. Instagram. It is an honor to welcome him here to the Coin Cave and get lots of amazing knowledge from him. He is what I would call an expert on Canadian coin grading. Um, it is very subjective here in Canada. There aren't too many options and it's very difficult. So I thought it'd be a good thing to bring him onto the show to have him break it down for us, uh, what some of the options are, pricing and stuff like that. But before that, um, what do you say you let the people know just a little bit of how you got into the hobby and uh, some stuff like that? Well, thank you. Um, I got into the hobby like many others. Um, um, just going through my coins in the change, uh, I saw the different commemoratives that we were putting out. I started pulling them out, uh, making a little collection of the different colorized coins, um, the nice Olympic set, and eventually I started accumulating a bit of a collection. Um, my uncle, he did the same thing, so he started encouraging me with silver, um, and that kind of just spiraled into where I am today. Okay, so at what point did uh, the grading coins come into the equation? Because they are a pretty tricky market here in Canada, they are pretty expensive. And uh, so where did you start off? Well, um, I was frequenting this uh, local coin shop, uh, Century Coin and Stamp, and um, Taking up some of the raw proof-like dollars and uh, just stuff from my silver stack, I started to get some stuff that was a little nicer shape. When I was there, I noticed they had a few different types of coins. They had stuff in slabs that a lot of people see. Um, but they also had these flips from this company called ICCS. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to kind of find out a little bit more about that. And uh, when I looked into it, I found out there's a couple of good options here in Canada. Um, it really just depends what you're looking for out of a grading company. So um, explain the differences and processes between like uh, this company ICCS because I have used them in the past or sorry I haven't used them but I have purchased them and I plan on using them and I know you have used mm -hmm. them for grading. So um, explain the differences between the companies like how much it costs and uh, how long it takes and stuff like that and because uh, you've also mentioned that ICCS prefers not to uh, do errors and stuff yeah. like that. So just kind of break down to us like your preferences in terms of where you like to send certain coins, the price differentials, how much it costs to ship it there and back. So my go-to personally is PCGS. Um, they're one of the two major companies down in the US that does coin certification. Um, I find that I gravitate towards them for the security of the slabs as well as it's just nice to have a coin in the slab. It's aesthetically pleasing. You know your coin's gonna be safe. 
And they really do a fantastic job there with their team of taking great photographs and uh, really just making sure that you feel good about having your coin secured. Um, but they have a few problems for sure. First off, shipping coins internationally gets costly pretty quick, especially when you're talking insurance. Um, when I look to go get coins graded, it's because I see they have nice eye appeal um, or they're of a higher value. Say, for example, you find like a nice 91 quarter in your change and it's a good min state candidate. Um, you don't really want that getting lost, so you're going to put insurance on the package. And shipping that internationally, it, it gets expensive quick. So when you send off an order for uh, PCGS, is there a minimum amount? You said before you like to have your friends kind of backpack onto your orders. So what's the minimum amount you like to send off? And then how much do they usually charge here in Canada per each submission, depending on uh, how much the coin is actually worth eventually? So the way they do their submissions, you don't have to have... Um, any more than just one coin to actually submit. But with shipping costs from Canada to the States, a package is gonna run you 40, 50 bucks with insurance. Um, and then coming back, PCGS does flat rate international shipping. So anything under a $22,000 value, they'll ship back for 70 US. So if you're only sending one coin, shipping alone is gonna run you 100, $150. Whenever I send my submissions, I try to get at least 20 coins. That's enough to fill a PCGS box, which they send um, with your order on the way back. And that just kind of makes sure that you're not spending too much on shipping and it kind of breaks down evenly to each coin. The unfortunate part, I guess, is the burden falls yeah. on you for the insurance and stuff like that. So if something was to go wrong, that, but the good thing with insurance is that uh, like if anything happens, you obviously get compensated for it, but uh, how much are you actually compensated for the full amount? Like if it's actually 20,000, because I know people in the past have had, mm -hmm. like I know Pokemon cards, if someone sends yeah. off a bunch of Charizards and they get lost and it's worth like $20,000, sometimes it can be hard to explain to a shipping company that something that, like that is actually worth that kind of value. So does that, like, do you feel validated in sending these off that if it was get to get lost that you would actually be compensated properly? Um, I have enough faith in the shipping system where I'm not too worried about that per se. Um, with just flat rate shipping, you can throw a hundred bucks on a package for two dollars and fifty cents. Um, so depending on how much there is, I find it's best just to, for ease of mind, ensure the full amount of the package so that you don't have that issue of doing paperwork and trying to make people believe that what was actually expensive is expensive. Um, okay. Per coin at PCGS, Alongside the shipping, there's obviously a certification fee. Um, I tend to go standard when I go to PCGS, which is they'll grade anything under a $2,000 value. And that comes with free TrueView photos, which are professional photographs, Ooh. as well as the um, NIFC slabs, which just have a feature where you can scan them with your phone. Um, kind of like Apple the, Pay. It also comes with the uh, barcode, so you can go yeah. up on the site, look up the population and stuff like that. The slabs are very beautiful too. Like yeah. If you have a coin slabbed up from PCGS, I would say that they're the most beautiful way you can display your coin outside of, uh, well, yeah, that's pretty much the most beautiful way you can display your coin. Yeah. The uh, individual certification for standard is $45 UH, which is a bit steep, because that brings you to about $60 per coin Canadian. Um, so that's why PCGS might not be the best choice all of the time. The second option, um, and I'd say probably the better option for Canadian coins is ICCS. They're a family run business that has a lot of good experience and um, a beautiful reputation um, from the founder who was a really big figure in Canadian numismatics uh, while it was still developing in like the 80s and the 90s. They have their office located in downtown Toronto, um, and they have a much more affordable rate. They'll certify coins for only $12 per coin. That's not bad. So yeah. is it a base rate of $12? Because I've also heard if you uh, if you submit like a certain threshold, like 20 or mm -hmm. 100, then you can get uh, cheaper. But is it for just a plain submission is $12, no matter who you are out there? No matter who you are out there, But there's going to be a, there's going to be additional shipping costs, obviously. But if you send 10 coins off and you pay the shipping, then each coin, well, you might actually get a discount, let's say, if you send 12 coins mm -hmm. off. But uh, 
So other than the shipping, it's just going to be 12 bucks a coin. 12 bucks a coin. And um, with them being in Canada, again, the shipping is not nearly as bad as it would be if you're trying to send down to either NGC or PCGS in the States. Um, ICCS as well, they're kind of the favorite for dealers in Canada. If you've ever been to a coin shop, I'm sure you've seen the ICCS flips in person. And that's just because they're affordable, they're reputable, and they're known by most Canadian collectors. Um, so if you want to get some nice coins you found, uh, certified, or even just something you've picked up into a nice secure holder, I definitely suggest ICCS as one of your top picks if PCGS is feeling a little too expensive for you. So you've also resubmitted coins from ICCS and you have uh, they're pretty conservative in terms of their grading. So yeah. sometimes if you resubmit an ICCS coin, you can actually get a higher designation on it. Yeah, especially um, during the early days of ICCS, they were really focused on um, just technically grading the coin. So they only really cared about surface flaws and imperfections. Stuff like toning and eye appeal wasn't really in the equation for them. So oftentimes you'll find an older ICCS holder that seems really low compared to Detay's standards, and that's because it probably is. Um, a buddy of mine uh, has done really well for himself picking up older ICCS slabs and um, cracking them out and resending them to make a quick buck for sure. Nice, nice. Okay, so um, I know that ICCS isn't a big fan of uh, doing errors and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. I also, I went to their website and I was doing a bit of research and they also have some trouble grading old nickels I, I saw yeah. on their site. What's the reason exactly for that? Do you have any idea why that might be? Um, the issue with the old nickels is just how nickel wears. Since it's such a hard metal to wear, um, when you see any sign of wear on the coin itself, um, you automatically throw it out of mint state. The problem with that though is you can have a coin that's actually been in circulation for a decent amount of time that's not really showing any wear on the surfaces but is extremely dinged up with bag marks or contact marks. Um, because of this, it's kind of hard for them to distinguish if a coin's truly a mint state example or if it has been circulated at some point. Um, as for the errors, back when they were being created, I believe they made some sort of agreement with um, the Charlton coin um, catalog and that agreement stated that they would certify only the Charlton varieties um, and they would exclude errors from a service they provided. Um, mm. The beauty of that is it allowed for a different Canadian company, CCCS, to be formed to fill that gap in the Canadian market for error coins um, to be certified. So in terms of reputation, how does CCCS, CCS, sorry, what, how is it? CCCS. CCCS yes. compared to ICCS. Um, I am personally not the biggest fan of CCCS for everyday coins. Um, if you do have a nice mint state coin or something like that, I wouldn't choose them as my top pick. Their reputation with grading just nice circulated coins or mint state examples isn't there. Um, and oftentimes you're not going to get the full value out of a coin that's graded in CCCS just because of that fact. However, they are the market leader in specifically error coins for the Canadian market. Um, it's why they were created mainly and it's what most error collectors look to in Canada when trying to get affordable slabs and affordable grading on their coins. Okay, so you have sent me some pictures in the past of some really rare coin sets, one of which is a specimen set. Now, which was the year that you sent me? Was it 1911? 1911. Okay, why don't you tell the people out there about the 1911 specimen set? Just a little bit of quick information because this, uh, when you were telling me about it and uh, sending me some messages and pictures, I, it was just absolutely blowing my mind, the mintage and the rarity and the value of this set. So I think some of the fine people out there would like to know about this amazing set. One of the really interesting parts of Canadian numismatics is our specimen coinage. Um, a lot of people might know specimen coins as proof coins, as they're called in the United States um, and other places around the world. But for some reason, the Canadian Mint had said publicly they had never made proof coins up until 1967. They did, however, make um, presentation sets in special years, like you were saying, in 1911, and on these cases for these presentation sets, it said specimen coins. So that's how we adopted that term of specimen. Um, the 1911 set in particular is a really cool year. 
Uh, it was the inauguration of George V. And so to kind of commemorate that, they created this five coin set, um, penny through half dollar, of these really well struck pieces on specially prepared planchets with specially prepared dyes that really are way nicer than any BU circulation strike you could ever find. Um, the problem was, it was so close to the last time they sent out a uh, presentation set, being 1908, the sales were really, really low for some reason. They had created a thousand sets, but only around 70 to 100 actually sold at the mint. The rest of the coins, we believe, were either melted or put into circulation. It's unclear because the mint didn't keep very good records. So you're um, saying there's a chance. There is a chance. There is a chance. Um, but with them being released and kind of destroyed, the mintage on it being so high doesn't really compare to the population, which is really, really low. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. for mo I know that uh, a lot of the early years of uh, specimen sets, like I've heard 1970, for example, they didn't actually release a. Spe they did release a specimen, but yeah. it was similar, only a thousand or ten thousand, yeah. very limited mintage, and that was for a lot of the earlier years. And then as they went on, they started releasing double mm -hmm. dollar sets. Um, I had it explained to me by the owner of a coin shop that the earlier days, like you said, pre 1967, were much easier for coin collecting because you would simply only buy three or four sets a year. That's all they would yeah. release, and then maybe one special silver dollar or something like that. So it was very easy for collectors to actually be able to purchase everything, and nowadays it's insane. Yes. They release every single day almost. They release a new coin, a new set. It's impossible to keep up, but back then, not only were they releasing new amazing sets, but they were also beautiful quality. Yeah. They were silver composition, a lot of the coins, mm -hmm. and even the pennies and stuff like that. They still, the value now is absolutely incredible. Yeah. I heard stories of uh, in the 80s and stuff like that, people would bring in some of these specimen sets and they would throw away the nickels and they would throw the way that throw away the pennies and they almost held no value to them and uh, like you said a lot of these coins can actually be unaccounted for yeah. and uh, whether they're actually in circulation or a lot of them might even just be mixed in with lots on eBay so yeah. like these 1911s that are unaccounted for if you purchase a lot of silver on eBay and they include some 1911s there is a possibility there's, there's, there, a, chance. There, there's a chance there's but, a chance but uh, there's always a chance but just like with anything you got to do your research yeah. knowledge is power the more knowledge you have the more ability you have to be able to detect these rarities and errors and stuff like that so you brought a lot of awesome slabs with you uh, why don't you tell them some of the really cool slabs that you're going to be showing us at the end of this video yeah I brought a lot of my uh, favorite collection pieces um, among them are this beautiful 1951 specimen penny it's got the most vivid blue toning on it I've ever seen um, some other really cool things are there are the five cent piece and 50 cent piece from the 1965 unofficial proof set. Um, I've also got a really beautiful 1965 Type 2 proof like dollar, an ICCS ultra heavy cameo. Um, and I've even got some Vicky errors, some um, coins struck on a delaminated planchet which are really rare and really cool to see. I like I like that you call them Vicky too, because they're, that is a common term. Yes, and, like, they, and they call the little five cent pieces, they start talking on my channel, they're like some little Vickies, and yeah. I was like, little Vickies, that's funny. Yeah. All right, well, let's, uh, let's show these guys some of these awesome slabs that you brought. So starting us out is this beautiful 1965 specimen proof nickel. This coin is attributed to one of the most important Canadian collections the Bellsberg Collection. Um, the name isn't very well known, but uh, his pride and joy was, he actually owned the 1911 dollar for a considerable time, about 10 to 15 years. Um, and it went from his estate, well, not his estate, he, uh, he's still active in the community today, but he sold it off to George Hans Cook in 2003. This was part of his 1965 specimen set and it's a beautiful coin with ultra heavy cameo obverse and reverse and crazy deep fields next is another beautiful specimen nickel this is a 1947 maple leaf the early specimens don't have that proof finish that uh, most people know today but um, the mirrored fields and the beautiful strike is really hard to miss compared to the business strikes of the era. Um, especially on nickel, which is just such a hard coin. It gets this beautiful finish that you really don't see on anything else. Here's that wonderful 1951 penny I was talking about. 
with just gorgeous, vivid blue toning on obverse and reverse. This coin was bought off a close friend of mine, BC Coins, and um, he bought it in an auction. And uh, he said when it arrived, the lot was still in an envelope that was labeled 2003. So this coin sat raw in a paper envelope for about 12 to 15 years before he cracked it out and uh, it emerged with this beautiful toning. Here's um, another part of my 1965 specimen set. This is a um, half dollar attributed to the Norweb collection, another very, very famous and important Canadian coin collection. Um, they were one of the really big players in the early days of Canadian numismatics and their collection comprised of mint states, uh, specimens, really anything they could get their hands on. They just try to get the nicest example. Um, it's weird though to see them with Elizabeth stuff because uh, they stopped really majorly collecting when um, coins of the Elizabeth era weren't really regarded as anything super special. So to see a 1965 specimen coin attributed to the collection is really, really cool. Here's another um, specimen penny. This one's actually a matte specimen from 1937. Um, in that year, we did two finishes. We did mirror and matte specimens. Um, the real distinguishing factor, the mirror ones, they look like every other specimen from the era, but the matte ones almost resemble business strikes, just with incredibly deep strikes um, and no contact wear or blemishes aside from this unfortunate carbon spot to notice. This is an example of a older slab as well, a PCGS old green holder as they're called. Um, like the ICCS old holders, back in the early days of PCGS, they were a lot more conservative. Um, so some people have been really successful buying old holders and cracking them out to resubmit for higher grades. Here's a beautiful 1950 specimen dime Specimen 65, it should be attributed with cameo or deep cameo with that crazy contrast on the obverse. This coin is mint lacquered and um, if we put it into lighting, you can see some toning that's actually present in the lacquer. There's a mark on the cheek that almost looks like a scratch, but it's just an imperfection in the lacquer. The Canadian mint was weird and um, selectively lacquered some of our early specimen coins without really rhyme or reason. So oftentimes when dealing with this area of the hobby, you find coins from the same year that are present with lacquer and some that aren't. Here's another beautiful specimen dime in 1964. In this year, they mass produced specimen dollars, but for some reason around 30 specimen dimes exist. No one really knows why, it's likely that they were made um, specifically for a dealer or a collector who had some sort of ties to the mint. Here's one of my favorite business strike coins. This is a 1914 five cent in MS64 with crazy rainbow toning on both obverse and reverse. I don't collect much mint state coins, but um, sometimes the eye appeal is enough where I'll pull the trigger. Aside from specimens, one of my favorite parts of the hobby is error coins. This is a 1931 nickel with a considerable grease strike through on the reverse. If you see at five o'clock on the reverse, there's this really deep pit where there was grease obscuring the die, um, which in turn created this blemish on the coin where it almost looks like the design is muted. It's really tough to find old coins like this with considerable mint errors. And it's my favorite Canadian coin design. So this is one of my favorite collection pieces for sure. With errors being one of my favorite parts of the hobby, um, when I saw this coin, I absolutely had to have it. This is a 1943 half dollar with an incredibly big struck through reading segment um, on the obverse. You don't typically see strike throughs of reading like this, where you can see each individual read. Um, typically they're struck through on the side, so it just kind of looks like a wire, but um, it's clear that this coin 
was just struck through by a big piece of reading and it's left this beautiful indentation. Um, this is probably my favorite coin that I have in my collection at the moment. Along with that, and going back to toners and mint states, this was actually the first major coin I bought from my collection. This is a 1935 silver $1. First year of the design. It was XICCS Mint State 66. PCGS didn't agree with the toning. They believe it to be artificial, but I know deep down that this is authentic cabinet toning. I'm gonna send it back um, in about a month's time to see if I can't get a straight grade. Because right now it sits in a questionable colors um, slab, which I don't agree with. But that's the game you play when you deal with third party graders. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Here, and one that's a little hard to see on camera, is this King George VI Brockage Penny. Brockage is when a coin is struck and then gets stuck to the die, creating a die cap. That coin that gets struck to the die then strikes the next coins that come into the press. And as you can see in the light there, the reverse image is actually put onto the coin. So right directly in the middle there, that's actually King George's ear, along with the Maple Leafs. So this is a really interesting coin. This was the first error coin I ever bought. And it's one of my favorites to this day. Another service that provides third-party grading is NGC. They're the um, second competitor down in the States. They also do a fantastic job. However, I don't personally like the eye appeal of their slabs. They kind of look like soap boxes to me, so I, I much prefer the clear style of PCGS, and that's why they're my preferred choice. On some issues as well, um, such as proof likes, um, I find NGC is a little bit liberal with the way they grade, and often hairlines that I feel should dock marks um, slip through the cracks. And Just the soapbox thing. Oh, no, they're like, it's true though. Like, look at that, seriously. It looks like a fire soap. Here's a beautiful proof like dollar. This is a 1964 dollar. Um, this year is one of the best for cameos. Um, oftentimes you can find these really deep, ultra heavy cameo coins. Some even still in the original mint cellophane. This example is an NGC PL66 ultra cameo. Um, I don't believe that the cameo is strong enough for the elusive ultra heavy cameo designation at ICCS, but it's definitely a beautiful example that really speaks for itself. ICCS is the company most of you are probably familiar with from going to your local coin shops. They're a Canadian company with a lot of history um, and a real good reputation with the community. The one major downfall is the vinyl flip that they certify their coins in. Unlike the slabs from PCGS and NGC, these vinyl flips are harder to see through um, and they don't store as easily. That being said, the grading is almost always accurate and um, it's really hard to find a disappointing coin certified at ICCS. One of the other downfalls of ICCS is the vinyl flips sometimes bubble. So although this beautiful 1938 quarter is toned all pretty, is an MS63 example, the ICCS flip makes it really difficult to appreciate its true beauty. That being said, at only $12 a coin, it's really hard not to be pleased with the service that ICCS provides for the Canadian coin community. One of the biggest markets that ICCS appeals to is the proof-like and specimen market. The way ICCS deals with Cameo is on an obverse basis only. So oftentimes, they disregard the Cameo strength on the reverse. As you can see here, although this side is beautiful, there's not as heavy as a contrast between the fields and the devices. With PL Canadian coins, most times, the most beautiful obverses are paired with some of the worst reverses. So having ICCS only focus on that beautiful obverse makes them really, really appealing for proof like collectors. This example is a Type 2 $1965, an ultra heavy cameo grade, a really elusive grade to have for this type, 
and one of the big reasons that people flock to ICCS for this area of the hobby. These last two coins are a beautiful pair of Vickies with the same error from two different dates, two different denominations, and even one of them is a provincial. These coins were struck on delaminated planchets that delaminated before entering the striking chamber. So right at the top of that coin there, 12 o'clock, you can see this line going from left to right. That's actually caused by part of the coin breaking off due to some sort of imperfection in the alloy or internal pressure when the coin was made. These are really, really rare to see. And it's even rarer to see a second with the exact same error from the same era. I bought these coins about a week apart and I didn't know about either of them in the days before I bought them. This is what I love about the hobby. Sometimes things just come at you that you really have to take advantage of. Opportunities like this really don't happen every day. And that's what makes coins so interesting. Thanks you all for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed these beautiful coins from my collection. If you guys want to check me out, I'm on Instagram at Burlington Bullion and my good buddy at DC Coins. Alright, peace out. Have a good one, y'all.